When initially introduced into the Bleach series, the race known as the Quincy were stated to be a proud people, human beings born spiritually aware that are able to sense and eventually develop an ability to manipulate the natural spiritual energy that resides within the atmosphere, also known as Reishi. Combining this Reishi with Rarioku, one's own spiritual pressure or power, they can create objects like weapons to defend themselves and their communities. Once known as the Chosen People, they were descended from the gods themselves. With their spiritual abilities to prove it, in hopes of keeping this power from diluting, they resorted to plans such as eugenics to keep the Quincy bloodline pure, a race that prides themselves on their traditions, a group that could be seen as very stuck in their ways. Their stubbornness is what dwindled them down down to such low numbers by refusing to entrust the extermination of Hollows to the Shinigami, their ideology, as theorized by Mayori, having little to do with the overall choice their race made, claiming it had more to do with a Quincy's inability to resist holification, resulting in them being poisoned and dying, rather than simply becoming holified like a Shinigami. Diametrically opposed to both Hollows and Shinigami, the Quincy King paved a path for all that came after to follow, and for nearly a millennia, the Quincy's did their best to stick to these principles and survive the long absence of their majesty. Some straying from the path of greatness, the display of stern ridders that we see in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, each being dynamic and unique in their own ways. A lot of them are a far fetch from what you would assume a typical homogenized Quincy we've been led to expect would look like. Where to even begin with Kurge? A man of such grace and majesty, handpicked by Yuhaba in order to run a grand selection of the Arankar in Huecomundo, trusted to eliminate the weak from his majesty's new kingdom and force the strong to submit to the domination of the Quincy race. Kurge Opi sits on such a high pedestal, he won't even dirty his shoes with the sands of Huecomundo, sat comfortably in his throne suited for a true Quincy lord, placed neatly on the mat beneath. After Haribel was captured, Hueco Mundo was able to be reduced to such little numbers, the entire surrounding area of Las Noches was left with a mere handful of Arankars, to which Kurge planned on dwindling even further by having every remaining Hollow fight each other in a tournament of will. But before that, Kurge figures that they didn't take enough of a beating the first time, and despite being the survivors of the initial invasion, they must first prove themselves by kneeling and begging to join the Empire. Or they can just get impaled through the torso. Their Bruh. choice. Bruh. This one Arankar tries to ask a question, and he immediately gets boom disconnected from the call. Kurge doesn't have oh, any time for bullshit. I'm pretty sure he just stabs another guy here because he felt like it. His subordinates aren't even sure if he plans on actually letting any Arankar enter their ranks. Kurge goes to take out a third victim, but this time, his spear gets dodged, and a helping hand comes along to slice that thing in half. It's Lolly and Melanie. Who? And despite really thinking they were doing something here, Kurge immediately knocks them both out with a flick of the wrist, not even gracing the trash by watching them fall to the floor after he cuts them down. Having his underlings go after and pick up the trash. They passed Kurge's test though, at least they had the balls to stand up against a true Quincy Alpha like him. He's even feeling himself enough to talk shit on Aizen, fellow immortal god Alpha Male, talking about how he must not have been all that to keep subordinates like that in his ranks. This man is so disgusted, I'm surprised he didn't pull out the spray deodorant like my man Ghetto. It's a damn springtime for monkeys! He honestly might have if he didn't get immediately pulled up on, but Kurge just stopped mid-sentence and turned to catch the attack that was coming for him. That speed, that awareness, only a true Quincy could move like that. Even as they slaughter his crew, he looks at the Trezbistas like they're not even gum under his boots. Those eyes are the expression of a man you just made dirty his boots with that Huecomundo sand. sand. As one of his men run up asking for a retreat order, Kurge kindly obliges by helping him retreat from life. And trying to convince the Trezbistas to lay down their arms, he just met them and he already knows that his powers are far beyond their comprehension. Bred specifically for utmost perfection, Kurge wears this elegance on his sleeve, preaching the gospel of his majesty to the three Arankar in hopes these strong women can be of use to the Quincy Empire, urging them that there is no greater happiness than living and dying under Quincy rule. Back check that. And after they decline his offer, you can literally see the sadness in this absolute Chad's face. Like shit, I really have to fold you motherfuckers. And that's exactly what he does. One, two, three, triple homicide on Pleco Mundo 
Mango Street. This man just will not stop and he just does not care. Your life is nothing. Literally just bored. Looking up as Ichigo arrives, completely unbothered that the special high level war potential just showed up at his front doorstep. Kyrgyz is only concerned he might break a sweat in his finest Quincy attire. It's not even like Kurge doesn't know who he is. He calls Ichigo out by name and instantly sicks his goons on him upon arrival. In fact, it seems like Kurge is actually happy that Ichigo decided to show up. All these warm-ups, it's about time someone gave Kurge the main <laughs> yeah, course. Boy. Finally, able to let out some real power, Kurge pulls out that clean-looking saber and fires off some reishi arrows, revealing that he's so Quincy, even his sword is a bow and arrow. Get a load of this fucking guy. He hits all shots on Ichigo, and even though Ichigo turns it around on Kurge and ricochets those shots right back at him, Kurge immediately just brushes that nonsense off. Just just says his lack of skill is dizzying. Skill issue. What? Are those the words of a man who sounds worried? I think not. The man among men is even so modest to deny Uryu's holy arrows are weaker than his. Even presented with an opposing view, Kurge just immediately knocks that shit away and doubles down on his Quincy ideology. Absolutely based. Once again, a true Quincy patriot. Kurge thinks it's time to stop messing around, especially since he just got the okay to eliminate Kurosaki. This man wasn't even ordered to kill him yet. So loyal. Immediately going into Let's Steal and unlocking the final state of the Quincy and unleashing his ultimate power and holy form. He correctly states to Ichigo, what he knew of the form is a tainted, outdated form that has since been reshaped and developed into an even greater amplification of strength. And how could it not be? In the hands of such a dedicated follower of the craft, Vol Standig never fit anyone better. Even both Chad and Inoue are taken aback. Like, damn, this bitch is beautiful. My man's got the Prada boots on, flawless. Kurge instantly teleports behind Ichigo with intense speed. And even as Kurosaki tries to run away, Kurge is still able to keep up with him and actually land real attacks on the substitute Shinigami and putting Ichigo on the back foot. And as Ichigo normally does when he's on the back foot, he starts talking shit. Kurosaki's confidence bolsters him into feeling a slight relax on Kurge's blade, triggering him to take the opportunity and strike a large Getsuga Tensho right into Kurge's throat. But this man just eats it! Full on buster blade to the neck, no damage! Kurge is a mad lad, said, is that really all you got? Smacks Ichigo's big butter knife away like it's nothing and goes, all right, bet. You ain't seen nothing yet. And now, shit just gets really out of pocket. All of a sudden, Orihime's Santen Keshun starts getting sucked away, completely disintegrating the civilians' defenses. But it's not just Orihime's barrier. Everything in Hueco Mundo composed of Reishi is being completely absorbed by Kurge's Volstandig. Like a giant hammer of light, Kurge welds this massive amount of Reishi into a terrifying attack, literally named God's Justice and throws it around as he's about to inflict the entire remaining population of Hueco Mundo with pure, holy damage. Right at this moment, the large buildup of spiritual energy shatters like glass, and before Kurge even has time to react to that despelling of his technique, he takes a devastating wallop to the mint. Laid directly on his ass, Kurge looks up at the gargantuan monster that stands before him. While Kurge was too busy focusing on the substitute Shinigami, the Trezbistas perform their ultimate tag team finisher, the summoning of Aeon, the Destroyer. A horrifying amalgamation of the fusion of the three Fraction level Arankar's arms. Ion is an indiscriminate mass of strength that thrashes about and takes out anyone that lies in its path. It was enough to demolish one, two, three, four, literally almost five vice captain level Shinigami at once and needed to be dispatched by head captain Genrusai Yamamoto before it could cause any more trouble. The beast lets out a sharp bellowing wail and lunges forward at the hunter squad captain who gallantly opposes the creature, proclaiming a monster like him could never beat him. Oh, oh my god. Did he stop him? Oh, oh my lord. Heinrich, he literally put him in the dirt. I've never seen something so disgusting. Good God. Apache walks over after the absolutely disgraceful funeral burial we have just witnessed here today to go talk shit. But then, my man was alive the whole time. He stabs her in her shit. 
gets up and just literally unbreaks his neck. Like, damn, Yuha Ba needs to adjust the durability of Blue. Everyone is speechless. Even Ion got his mouth shut, for they are in the presence of his holiness, the one closest to God. And for this transgression, this blasphemy, they must all be silenced. Kurge immediately sets his sights on Ion, the biggest threat at the moment besides Ichigo. This cocky motherfucker looks at the giant hulking monster that just bent him crooked not even a minute ago and tells him for once in his life, he's actually about to live. Ion's obviously like, mm, cap, and charges in, but everyone else can tell something is not right. And they were right, because this time, instead of the ratio all around the area, Kurge instead literally just starts sucking up Aeon's body matter like a vacuum, literally reducing this man to a skeleton, and then for good measure, absorbing all that up too. And this, my friends, oh, this is the reason my man Kurge is number one Quincy Patriot, the one closest to God, for this ability, this one power alone. Kurge's ability, called Sklav Ray, Holy Slave, allows him to literally dominate every form of Reishi and force it to submit to his will. A basic Quincy technique, but maximized and utilized to its fullest extent. Kurge's natural potential as a Quincy allows him to subjugate even spiritual beings themselves beneath his heels and completely devour them. Everyone in the immediate area can sense this fuckery from a mile away. Kurge just put on a sale on ass whoopings and the promo commercial just aired. Sun Sun's first instinct is to quickly call forth her ability Snake Shell Fortress, which summons a large barrier around her and all of the remaining party in Hrekomundo. Kurge just lowers his head like, damn, they really think that low of me, huh? The Aram cars are literally sweating. Sun Sun, who's in the middle of explaining how her defense shield works and how it will help them accomplish their plan when, yoink, this man was listening the entire time, said, yeah, that would have been a good plan, you thought, and then just starts ripping them all apart with his reishi stealing ability. Instead of letting them perish slow and torture them, Kurge, remembering his holy status, doesn't allow himself to give in to such a sinful act. He will take them out quickly and subjugate them all to reishi. In typical Bleach fashion, Ichigo Kurosaki arrives to save his friends again, this time in Bankai. With a precise blast of Getsuga aimed directly at Kurge's holy halo, his reishi control is disrupted, which allows Ichigo to level the playing field again and engage in swordplay with the holy angel. <laughs> Lights of blue flame engulf the entire Seireite as pillars of Reishi ignite like beacons of war for the Quincy invasion. Without wasting any time, the blood warfare begins. On orders of shoot to eliminate, as the Sternritter flock to Soul Society at the Quincy King's call, with the substitute Shinigami absent, the purge can ensue without any obstacles in the Great Empire's path. Each Sternritter intends to prove their usefulness to their majesty, and rack up as high a body count as possible, and maybe take a souvenir home with them as well. The matchups between the 13 court guards and the Quincy begin. Captains and lieutenants alike picking fights with the invaders to defend their home. But most importantly, the balance of the realms themselves. As the seatless division members dwindle by the second, the heads of their divisions have no choice but to use the entirety of their power to crush the Sternritter and leave behind no trace. Of all the interesting battles that transpire in the first invasion, the member of the Vandenreich who steals the show and leaves the largest impression without any doubt is Sternritter F. S. Not. For even as the being of pure horror emerges from his pillar of flame, the Shinigami around bear witness to his murderous tendencies. Surrounded by a ring of thorns, the Quincy impales his enemies with no show of mercy. The officers, as they watch their comrades fall, acknowledge everything they've done has been useless against Esno. Meanwhile, with just one touch of those thorns, their ends are a shoo-in. But not only that, the scariest thing is how loudly Esnot's victims scream as he extinguishes their spirits. Terror filling the atmosphere, almost as if this was intentional. 
The non-seated Shinigami begin to cower and flee from their positions, leaving just one lone officer screaming at his subordinates to hold their ground and meet their dooms with honor. His commands fall on deaf ears as his fellow squad members get further away as Note only grows closer. Just at this moment, Zabimaru Shikai rips through the air and closes the gap between Esnote and the nameless Soul Reaper. Renji offers his respects to the officer before claiming he's more than willing to take it from here, as the Stern Ritter's expression remains unfazed. After multiple strikes from Zabimaru, Renji is just as unsuccessful as his lower ranked officers, unable to cause any damage whatsoever to the malicious entity before him. S-Note is even able to block Renji's attacks with his bare hand. Blut Ven, the pattern that appears on S-Note's hand, creates a powerful defense for Quincy to withstand physical damage. Having no choice but to simply speed up his attack pattern, their short scuffle is interrupted by Sternritter Masked Demasculine, who appears above Renji and throws a fist down at the Vice Captain. And despite being able to dodge, the newly arrived Sternritter quickly fires another punch. This time, blocked by our second party crasher, Division 6 Captain Byakuya Kuchki, who reminds Renji he need not show these intruders any mercy. They are foreign invaders who mean to annihilate the Soul Society. They must be destroyed with an overwhelming show of force. With one step taken towards the two Shinigami, Byakuya strikes with Senbon Zakura. Despite all previous attacks showing no signs of working, Senbon Zakura immediately tears through S-Note's blood vein and critically damages his hand, much to Masked Masculine's surprise, who Byakuya also makes quick work of, shredding the ground beneath his feet and causing it to cave in, ejecting him from the battlefield. Now with it being a two-on-one, the Soul Society employs its counter defense. Already aware of the Quincy's ability to seal Bankai, the captains are fully prepared to accept the consequences, as long as they have each of their respective lieutenants to pick up the slack. The only way to break the seal will be to uncover its secrets. And hell, like Soy Fan even mentions, nothing to worry about if they can just win before they lose their Bankais. With confidence and an unyielding familiarity with victory, with their vice captains in support, the captains all individually summon their Zanpakuto's final releases in unison. Checkmate. Like taking candy from a baby. Instantly, each captain's Bankai is whisked away from them as soon as they emerge, pulled directly into the medallion each Quincy carried specifically for this moment. As captain of the 6th division, Byakuya's power is dispelled. He looks on at the imposing stern ritter S-Note as the realization begins to overcome him. Senbon Zakura Kageyoshi was not just sealed, it was completely stolen. With each Stern Ritter collecting their opposing captain's Bankai, the Shinigami are frozen with shock. Hitsugaya Toshiro admits his Zanpakuto spirit has gone silent as he yells out his sword's name in defiance of the reality the Soul Society has just been faced with. With no choice but to hope they can deter any other captains from losing their Bankais, they broadcast this new knowledge along a Tente Kurai Kido, much to Kurotsuchi Mayuri's displeasure, who's angry the other Shinigami couldn't wait for him to complete his analysis of the situation before going off and experimenting on their own accord. The invasion shifts momentum after this development, as captains that haven't lost their Bankai are now extremely handicapped regardless. Even captain of the 7th division, Chunsui Kyoraku, finds himself lacking the proper morale to put up a good fight, losing an eye against the Stern Ritter he faces and at a loss for what their next move should be. Despite watching Byakuya's Bankai be torn from his hands, in desperation, Vice Captain Abarai Renji intends to ignite his own Bankai in retaliation against Esno, but Byakuya stops him, stating that they can't lose any more releases to the enemy, to which a hopeless Renji questions aloud, how are they supposed to win a war like this? Bankai Ichigo being the most formidable threat in the bunch, as the two continue some back and forth, Kurge finds it impossible to steal Ichigo's Bankai, which allows the latter to actually keep up with the Quincy, even with Aeon's Reishi amplifying his strength. Kurge has a hard time believing that Ichigo is able to surpass him in strength, but to be fair, Ichigo is also him, and when two hymns engage in battle, 
there always ends up being one him who is more him than the other him. And that him is him. Kurge fires more holy arrows that Ichigo is able to slash away and deflect with his Bankai's heightened speed. Kurge correctly noting this as being his main problem. Only being able to use Blute Vene or Blute Artery at separate times, not simultaneously, means he has to leave himself open for a chance to do any real damage to the Shinigami. Kurge wonders if he needs reinforcements, knowing the threat he's up against. And my man, the fucking Chad, says hell no to that. I ain't afraid of shit. And then he gets backstabbed by Kisuke. Isn't that some shit? Literally one of the coolest, most cold-blooded and calculated Quincy's we've ever seen and ever will see, and he gets taken out with absolutely no respect to his character. You see, the problem was Kubo made Kurge way too strong and realized that complete manipulation of all reishi in the area was way too OP. Not a single Quincy after this uses Sklav Rai. Is it because they all could and just chose not to? Or is Kurge really just that fucking guy? I'm pressed to believe the latter statement. Because even after getting taken out from behind, my man Kurge makes a comeback again. Ranzo Ten guy. oh my god, are you kidding me? This man has all the stops. We literally have not seen Ranzo Ten guy since Soul Society arc, when Uryu fought Mayuri. This is some real Quincy history. Literally, the only other character to do this besides Uryu. You can't tell me Kubo didn't realize he made a mistake with this entire race of characters, bro. Kurge Opie is Schmitty Warbin Jaegerman Jensen. He is number one. In his last moments, he uses his shrift, the letter J, for his jail ability. I'm going to jail! A cage of indestructible Ryatsu that keeps its prisoners locked inside no matter how hard they attempt to break out. Even with his dying breath, Kurge imprisons Ichigo inside this cage throughout the entire first invasion, as more and more souls are erased from Seireite by Quincy hands, despite announcing Ichigo Kurosaki's incoming arrival and his immunity to the Bankai medallions. His entrance is delayed by Sternritter J's imprisonment technique. As the substitute Shinigami continues to attempt to escape, a cut tears across Kuchiki Byakuya's shoulder. As blood erupts from the wound, his vice captain Captain attempts to step in, but the 6th Division Captain doesn't allow him to interfere. Instead, choosing to have him observe from afar like their original plan. Byakuya, though, is noticing his body begin to shake. Trembling, he wonders if the thorns that S-Note carries around him have some kind of poison ability. The Sternritter picks up on this, though. Intuitively guessing the captain might have assumed his ability has something to do with toxicity. But the truth is, what is making Byakuya shudder is a feeling that he's hidden deep inside. An emotion that through many hardened battles and experiences, Byakuya has learned to suppress and ignore for centuries. A crippling sensation that S-Note notes as being none other than fear itself. The Sternritter actually compliments the captain, stating most Shinigami before him had perished instantly upon contact with his thorns. Not from actual injury, but from blood-curdling terror. Fear is inevitable for all those who touch S-Note's quote-unquote arrows. Anxiety builds up. One starts to question every little move, every possibility, to the point breathing or even thinking is a troublesome act. Even if Byakuya is enduring through the horror and holding up his blade, while threatening, that is all it truly is. A threat. And a threat is a far stretch from what S-Note defines as causing true fear. Slashing at the Quincy's chest, Byakuya vehemently denies the Sternritter's words. Mentally, he fights against S-Note in his head, denouncing his power, when suddenly... <laughs> Struck right through the chest, S-Note gleefully looks over his wounded opponent, claiming Byakuya was so stifled by his anxiety, he was standing there motionless in the middle of their fight. No matter how much the captain has trained against fear, S-Note's ability strikes at the very core of the brain. Instinct cannot be overridden, like countless flies crawling over one's body. In distress, the captain screams out. Still attempting to repress his emotions, Byakuya lashes at the Sternritter with no clear plan or intent. Readying for a counterattack, a single blade petal swayed through the air beside his sister's head a distance away. Before this very moment, S-Note never considered himself much of an artist. But 
the masterpiece he painted with Byakuya's own Senbon Zakura Kageyosh could be considered nothing less but beautiful. Falling to the ground, S-Note pities the captain, acknowledging Byakuya's attempts to beat his own Bankai with Shikai is futile. In one final effort to save his captain, Abarai Renji enters the battle and swings his Zabimaru down against the Sternritter, still unable to do any considerable damage to the Quincy, despite landing clear blows to the flesh. As S-Note prepares to create another picture-perfect ending, Byakuya, in spite of all his injuries, arrives again to take attention away from his lieutenant. Throwing all care for his art career away, the Sternritter instead chooses to completely drown the 6th Division captain in blade petals, a torrent of cuts ripping through Byakuya like a wave of razor blades. As blood fills the sky around the area, Esnote shows no signs of stopping, releasing a second flood of petals upon the captain, launching him into the high tower above while Renji pleads for the the Quincy to stop. Seeing absolutely no other way out of this slaughter, the vice captain is willing to risk it all and attempts once more to summon his Bankai. But whether for his own good or not, he's interrupted by the return of Mask Demasculine, who sends Renji flying a great deal away with a payback punch. Much to S-Note's annoyance, who would have enjoyed a second Bankai to take home with him. As Byakuya's final breaths exhale, he can only apologize to Rukia and Renji, knowing, with his absence, they are not only at risk, but all of Soul Society. One of Seireite's greatest assets falls before Sternritter F, the Fear. Pronounced finished by the Quincy King and Jugram, they admit their conquest, despite the overwhelming success in their opinion, has taken far too long. The Sternritter lack ruthlessness. And right on time, with the three Sternritter impaled on his back, the menace known as Kempachi Zaraki approaches both Jugram and the Quincy King without a single ounce of hesitation, reminding the both of them why he was considered a special war potential. Kempachi took out all of his enemies with barely enough time to even figure out what all of their abilities were. Considering there's 26 of these guys, the herd did need to be thinned. Lacking patience as well, Kempachi strikes at the strongest person in the room, and the Quincy King was the one blinking on his Chad radar. As the two monstrosities collide, we cut over to Hasagi getting his contract required ass beating for this arc. Slammed into the wall by Sternritter O, the overkill aka Driscoll Birchy, aka the man with over 200 confirmed bodies, including Vice Captain Sasakabe Chojuro, <laughs> aka Gyarados with a Moxie ability, aka the man who's about to repeat the exact same spear fatality on Hisagi. <laughs> Knocking that nonsense aside, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Genrusai Shigekuni Yamamoto, the OG, the god of death, ready to protect his soldiers on the front line. Driscoll is overjoyed by the captain commander's arrival, not phased one bit by the strongest Shinigami who ever lived gracing him with his presence. If Sternritter O is one thing, he's bold. Driscoll takes out his Bankai medallion and plans to scorn this old grandpa by taking him out with his own vice captain's Bankai, the ultimate disrespect. Summoning a storm of lightning, Sasakibe Chojuro's Bankai, Koko Ganryo Riku, emerges around Driscoll like a brilliant display of power, as Yamamoto can only look back and see his former lieutenant standing before him. Hisagi is blown away by this devastating release of strength, totally unaware another Zanpakuto of similar caliber to Hyorin Maru existed, a Bankai that has remained dormant for over 2,000 years. The attack responsible for the second scar on Genyusai's forehead, the cocky Driscoll declares he should consider himself lucky he gets to see it one more time at his end. Isagi calls out to the captain commander, but it looks like the old man fell asleep at the wheel. Despite all laws of science and logic, lightning somehow strikes the same place twice and lands a second powerful blow on Yamamoto's unmoving body. 
which if this is the case and its power actually defies physics itself it's good this thing was in the hands of a cocky brat like this and not one of the smart stern ridders his bankai was so downright embarrassingly used yamamoto apologizes to the late chojiro that his ultimate attack would be remembered in the sorry ass state and he just straight up incinerates this man driscoll in one slash i mean he just completely melts this man's face like a gnarly ass guitar solo even his skeleton just turns to dust in the wind why are we still here walking away from the effigy he just lit for his dead homie shuhei is just speechless at the savagery he just witnessed frozen despite all this heat this old ass man just knocks the dust off his shoulder and goes yeah all right shuhei take five i'm gonna personally fuck each and every one of these nazi asses up and he just takes off like a fucking rocket just speeding through seireite like a flaming missile probably demolishing thousands of homes and barracks on the way who gives a fuck this man means business everyone in the surrounding area is like oh shit you know like when you're sitting around half-assing it at work and the district manager comes in to visit that day so all of a sudden you spring into action Everyone starts getting motivated with the captain commander showing up to the battlefield. Even Toshiro and Komamura, who lost their Bankais earlier, are reinvigorated with strength. After watching Yamamoto just speed through Soul Society like a bottle rocket, Lazy Boy Kyoraku even starts to step his game up. Shinji and Momo, who literally have not encountered a single Quincy and have just been running this whole time, say they gotta hurry up before Yama has all the fun. Spoilers, they don't do shit. On the other side of Soul Society though, it looks like the Quincy King actually somehow took the invincible Zoraki Kenpachi down. Which, damn, uh, uh, okay. We were getting a bit excited there, but let's remember where we are for a minute here. Yuhaba is just staring at this man's body as he holds his fingers in his damn throat. Like, like, wow, we really said you were a war potential? My son, my seed, you are brittle. We overestimated you troglodytes. When Golden Boy lights up the sky, Old Man Yama arrives and turns the entire surrounding area into a whole furnace, politely greeting his old friend Yuhaba, who he hasn't seen in over a thousand years. Remember what I said about the two hymns earlier? But before we get to the main event, the Sternritter are also up in morale due to their king taking part in the battle as well, somehow gaining enough courage to try and pull a good old fashioned group jumping on the nursing home resident. Three high level Sternritter all close in on Yamamoto, feeling strength in numbers, but the explosion that resulted afterwards could be felt from miles away, almost completely erasing these key members of the Sternritter army Yuhaba acknowledges it was their own fault for interrupting the clash of hymns. This was an arena where real recognizes real, and they failed the admissions test. Yamamoto gives Yuhaba a good old ocular pat down. Shit. Bring a knife to a fight, you better be ready to use it, you jabroni. Before immediately going in for a quick end. Actually landing a decent blow on his arm, Yamamoto claims that Yuhaba hasn't changed one bit. Which is such an ironic <laughs> no, fucking no, statement no. based on the way this battle ends, but we'll continue. After calling him old and pulling out his sword, Yamamoto decides to throw all caution to the wind. Despite knowing some of his subordinates had lost their Bankai, the god of death himself was sure no single man could wield such power but himself. As all flame, fire, and aura was cast away, disappearing in one moment, Yuhaba's face immediately changes up. Bankai, Zanka no Tachi, the flame, that cannot be tamed. Oh! Jugram is confused, as it seems quite uneventful for a Bankai from such a legendary figure. But Yuhaba is like, don't be fooled. This shit is about to get real. All firepower being sealed inside the Sword of Hellfire. The air throughout Seireite is oppressed instantly by the intense heat. All around the area, Yamamoto Zanpakuto is causing water to dry and skin to crack. Everyone who knows what's going on 
also knows that if Yamamoto does not finish this quickly, he might literally destroy everything. The Stern Ritter, who stole Hyorin Maru's release, can't even use it anymore because Yamamoto somewhere miles away summoned his Bankai. What kind of bullshit is that? How OP can you be? Negating an ability you didn't even know was being used in a completely different location. Now, forced to play a game of keep away, Yuhaba can't even let a single particle of Yamamoto's sword touch him, lest he be erased into smithereens like his buddy Driscoll. Wondering where all of the power of his sword is being held, suddenly, as the tip of Yama's blade touches the ground, it cleaves an enormous gulge with deadly heat. Scared shitless, now Yuhaba really has no choice but to dodge any way he can. Yamamoto explains not even Blute Vein can defend against the overwhelming deletion of his sword's flames. But the Quincy King gets tired of playing defense and slashes his own sword, which doesn't go so well for him. As the Zanpakuto's fire has not just been delegated to the tip of Yamamoto's blade, but it has also created a coat of armor that, although invisible, surrounds the Captain Commander at every inch. Claiming its flames reach over 15 million degrees, what a fucking obscene number by the way, Yama says his body and blade may as well be wrapped in the sun. The fucking sun. How do you compete with that? Even Jugram is like, wait, that doesn't even make sense. Something that hot wouldn't even be visible. Is this man literally just showing off right now? Which, yes. Yamamoto is just using his Ryatsu to create the illusion of flames enveloping him. Just doing all of this for the audience. What a piece of work. I thought Kempachi was pretentious. At this point, Yamamoto admits he should probably stop messing around before he casually just burns all of Soul Society to the ground. Meanwhile, Yuaba is coming to terms with the thermostat not being set the way he likes it, claiming if it wasn't for Blot Vein, he'd be reduced to ashes even at this distance away from the Captain Commander. Now it's Yamamoto's turn to start talking smack, and once he starts taking a step towards the Quincy King, this man flinches folds himself back like a piece of paper, and flings his little Quincy arrow with his tail between his legs. But old man Yamamoto just eats that like it's nothing. Just explodes off his flames like it never even existed. Oh, no more weapons? Oh well. Time to pack you up like a lunchbox, champ. Yuhaba figures it's time to stop playing games, and starts using some high-level Nazi magic, summoning forth a massive display of blinding light and holy power, a Quincy's ultimate spell of offense and defense, church song, sanctuary praise. Supposedly capable of eviscerating anything it comes into contact with, Yamamoto looks at this child's play like a plastic spoon to the kneecap. A waste of natural resources. Figuring that we're just showing off hyper gauge moves at this point, Yamamoto triggers the south end portion of his Bankai, Minami. Fire sword, fire defense, what could the next phase be? Raising the zombie corpses of the fucking past victims of Yamamoto's Zanpakuto in order to create an army of undead soldiers that also can be resurrected to resemble previous companions of Yuhaba to inflict maximum emotional, emotional damage amidst damage. being physically torn asunder by the skeletons. Out of left field? I think we can go further in my opinion. Resembling an actual necromancer, the true embodiment of a Shinigami, Genrusai Shigekuni Yamamoto truly is a force of nature that forced all of Soul Society to bend to his will, confirming his suspicions that Yuhaba didn't steal his Bankai not because he missed the opportunity, but because he legitimately could not wield that power, claiming Quincy's cannot steal that which they cannot comprehend. Yamamoto declares victory as the off-frame Quincy King begins to yell out in defiance of the momentum the Captain Commander carries, he must step through the remnants of his own fallen soldiers. Yuhaba is left like a sitting duck for Yamamoto's final Bankai creation, the direction of North. One final soul-crushing slash. A bit anticlimactic after South, but I digress. Yuhaba is nearly completely cut in half by the attack. And as the commander's Bankai begins to fade, with the oppressive heat finally disappearing, the elements respond with a shower of rain to balance the environment. But in the calm, a new storm was merely crawling itself onto the horizon. As Yuhaba lay slain on the ground, 
he apologizes for not being strong enough. Who the hell would you apologize to? Uh, oh, oh shit. <laughs> it's the Squad 1 Barracks. That's what just exploded. Yamamoto calls out for his left behind officer before the real King of Quincy's appear is behind Captain Commander. Realizing now that it was a fake who he had been fighting all along. Which... <laughs> As Yuhaba gives Royd Lloyd a proper send off and turns him into pure Reishi, one with the life stream. Yuhaba apologizes for being late to his date with the Captain Commander. As, to be completely honest, he was two timing and had another date right before him with fellow him council member Sosuke Aizen. Holding an unsanctioned him meeting without consulting the entire him council? Chalk up another war crime for Yuhaba. Yamamoto, ready to smoke some more Quincy meat, announces his Bankai a second time. But. <laughs> yup, just yoinks his shit. Yamamoto was completely wrong. Royd Lloyd was just too weak to handle Ryujin Jaka. The real Yuhaba, though. <sighs> Nothing. Now having the center stage, Yuhaba jokes that maybe now he should start resurrecting Yamamoto's dead men as payback. Rushing in with a rash decision, Yuhaba slashes Yamamoto's pitiful attack away, and showing the old man much more respect than the latter had showed him, Yuhaba breaks out the fine china, summons up the holy blade from the heavens just for the occasion, and at this point, demoralized, broken down, tricked, and completely beaten at his own game, the monster known as Genrusai Shigekuni Yamamoto, the fire of Soul Society, is extinguished. Look how sad he is. Like an upset old man who just got bullied into submission. And well, that's all she wrote, folks. Both Ukitake and Kyoraku feel Yamamoto's demise even from afar tripping Shunsui up into taking yet another hit from his opponent. And as the Quincy King decides to take his leave, even in death, Yamamoto Genrusai refuses to give up. But at this point, there's no hope. Yamamoto has been bested. Yuhaba has proven himself as the true mastermind, the victor of the blood warfare. For as he was willing to evolve with the times and do whatever it took to win, Yamamoto, once a warrior who walked the path of pure bloodshed, had let himself grow weak in a time of peace. And just like that, engulfed in God's holy light, the Captain Commander's final spark of ember is snuffed out. Not a single trace left behind. An absence that can be felt among all the Shinigami forces. With their morales crushed, it's time for the Quincy's to reign. As shadows emerge, more Quincy soldiers arrive to eradicate what remains of the court guard squads before the second phase of Yuhaba's plan takes place. Overlooking his newly conquered territory, Yuhaba plans to take his leave with Jugram before the Zero Squad descends to their location. But just before they can leave, on the other side of Kurge's jail, Kurosaki Ichigo screams out to the disappearing souls in Seirete, blinking out like lights in the darkness, when just as all hope seems lost. Right as holy arrows pierce his back, Akon freed Ichigo from the other side, and the Quincy that did it lies in wait. Well, 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 another weakling trying to mess with Shaz Domino, one of the strongest. <laughs> Arriving on the scene, Kurosaki Ichigo looks over the torn wasteland that once was Soul Society. His spiritual pressure impresses all over the Seireite as everyone feels the tide and atmosphere shift. Overlooking the defeated Renji and Rukia, the speechless Ichigo shun pulls away as the Sternritter tremble at the feeling of his heavy Ryatsu, visiting the 6th Division captain as he slowly withers away. Yaku Yakuchiki declares his failure as a leader of the court guard squads. Someone no one truly thought could be beaten, followed by the loss of the captain commander of the entire Gote 13. Rough day. The Soul Society is no more.
Unless this fucking guy has anything to say about it. Back at the destroyed Squad 1 barracks, both Jugram and Yuhaba are aware of Ichigo's arrival. And instead of dealing with that ticking time bomb, they decide to just leave their fucking mess on Seireite and leave. dip. But Zangetsu just fucking whips through the air and lands right in front of Yuhaba. Ichigo shows up right on cue. Like, going somewhere, pussy bitch? Yuhaba tries to play friendly with Ichigo at first, but this man doesn't have a single second to deal with the bullshit. You fucking stole everyone's bankai, completely wrecked the place, done cut the old man in half. What the fuck is up, dude? Yuhaba is like, yeah, fuck it, I smoked that pack. As Ichigo goes Super Saiyan, Yuha Ba is like, you see this shit, Jugram? Now he gives us no choice but to fuck him up. Ichigo rips right towards the Quincy King, and the two are just epically tearing the entire ground to shreds as they swing their swords. Yuha Ba, despite being an archer class, meets Ichigo every step of the way and knocks that motherfucker back into the dirt. Throwing out a Getsuga Tensho right afterwards, Yuha Ba is like, you've gotta quit that shit. Just slams him right back into the ground. For dinner, Yuhaba is serving dirt, and if you resist, dessert is a fat fucking flip. Even Jugram's like, bro, that was cold. But Yuhaba knows this isn't enough to stop Ichigo's stubborn ass. And he was right, because somehow while in Kurge's jail, Ichigo unlocked the Quincy memories within his Ryatsu, and was suddenly being protected by Blutvein. Despite this giant sword in the man's neck, he's back on his feet, ready to go. And after having a sleeve of his arm torn off after the blast, Yuhaba curses himself for not using an Arankar when attempting to trap Ichigo and Hueco Mundo. Going for another slash that's intended to strip Ichigo's sleeve, the blue markings of Blut Van travel all across Kurosaki's arm. Confirming Yuhaba's suspicions, he decides to drop some vague background lore, refuse to elaborate further, and then dip like a fucking Kingdom Hearts villain. Because right as Yuhaba is about to pierce through Ichigo's newly awakened Quincy blood, a throbbing mass of shadows spill from his sword arm, coating the ground around Yuhaba. Jugram reminds him that the invasion was on a time limit, and they've reached it. Yuha is like, no way, my phone reminder isn't set to go off for like another hour, oh my god. Even strapped down and imprisoned in the deepest, darkest dungeon, this man is still the GOAT! One conversation was enough to completely throw Yuha off his senses. Don't forget who the real villain of the story is, Proxy. <laughs> Beaten, defeated, given extra scenes just so he could be bullied even more, a broken down Ichigo yells at Yuha and Jugram as they try to make their leave. You're really not even gonna clean up this fucking mess, bro? Yuha Ba just looks back, doesn't even dignify this man with a response. Know your fucking place, trash. Ichigo charges at both of them, but Jugram just cuts this man's Zanpakuto in half. In half. Ichigo is here, Zangetsu is over there. Bro is flabbergasted. Yuha bids farewell to his son, born in the dark, like a because fucking Kingdom Hearts nobody. villain, and leaves Soul Society. The other Quincy's follow suit. After their conquest and complete disregard for all Shinigamis in the area, they just leave them to deal with the results. Everybody is just messed up wrought with survivor's guilt and coulda, shoulda, wouldas. They know that they got their asses absolutely handed to them, and quite frankly, yeah, it's pretty embarrassing. When they realize the Captain Commander's body was just eviscerated by Yuha, the heartbreak runs deep. Soifan literally shoots the messenger, who was telling them both Byakuya and Kempachi are messed up. Sheesh. Everyone starts yelling at everybody, but the one who comes in to save the day is also the person who recently became the coolest person in the room overnight. Look at that eye patch. Clearly leadership material. Kyoraku tries to rally the troops together. As angry as they all might be, and as big of an L they all might have taken, there is no time to mourn for their losses or dwell on past mistakes. The war is far from over. This was just the beginning in order to protect the Soul Society. They cannot look backward. Forward is the only direction they can move. Are they not the 13 Court Guard Squads? And from here on out, it's just a training arc, guys, so I'll be taking a break from covering some of these. But there is a battle coming up that I know some of you guys that are manga readers are very excited for. Make sure you leave a like, hit the subscribe button, and make sure you watch out for my next Bleach content, and check out some Jujutsu Kaisen content, by the way, while you're here. Thanks so much for watching, guys. 
Leave a like for the editor, as always. See you guys in the next one. Peace.